Um, now look, don't get me wrong, but have you noticed how hard it is to live as if God is real? Um, we know God's real, right? And we believe, yeah? Um, but uh, then we've got to get on with stuff. Um, we've got to get up in the morning, clean our teeth, have our breakfast, blah, 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 blah. And, and it is difficult to live like he's real all the time. And the difficulty with that is we start doing things the best way we think we know how. Yeah? And uh, God ceases to be a present part of our reality every day. Now, the point of the cross is this. Christ died on the cross to, bring, to deal with the sin that caused the disruption in our relationship with God and to bring us back into fellowship with the living God, the way it was in the Garden of Eden, blah, 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 right? So what God has done by the cross is to restore the relationship between us and himself so that we could know him and walk with him day by day, yeah? But the difficulty is you, you, you can't wander around in a permanent state of prayer meeting, can you? Because you, you've got to talk to somebody. How are you doing two things at once? Yeah. Oh, we've just been discussing that. So yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to do that. Yeah? It's hard to live like God's real. It's easier to live like you're a religious person because then there are rules and there are patterns of dress and there are ways of perhaps speaking with your head on one side, I don't know, that make you look like a religious person. And living like a religious person all the time is, is kind of easier than living with the reality of an ongoing relationship. Rules are easier than relationship, aren't they? With the living God. What we've got today is a bunch of people who've combined the two things. Living as if God and eternal realities are not for real and being religious and combining those two is fatal. So today we're dealing with religious secularists in Mark 12, 18 to 27. We're not Jesus's. It's part of the attack that comes on him after the clearing of the temple as he arrives in Jerusalem, this third act of Mark's gospel. They're coming for him, they don't like him, they're after him. And today the Sadducees attack in Mark 12, 18 to 23. They attack. So who are these guys? Uh, firstly, they are privileged people. Things in life, in this life, are going their way. Right? It's all going their way. They are elite families of high standing that tended to be amongst the Sadducees. The privileged, the wealthy classes, the nearest thing first century Judaism has got to aristocracy. They're privileged and they are secularists. They really didn't believe in a personal God or anything so common or vulgar as a God who affects your life, is involved in your life, or could be. They were secularists. What's a secularist? Now, this is interesting. I did a little bit of research because, I, well, let's get it clear. The secular society seemed to have kind of over the years rewritten the definition of what a secularist is to match up with something that most people will vote for. That's interesting, isn't it? It seems to be a popular thing. Uh, they've, they've, to, as far as I can understand, they've rewritten what secularism is. That would be my take on it. They say secularism is a principle that involves two basic propositions. The first is the strict separation of the state from religious institutions. The second is that people of different religions and beliefs are equal before the law. Now, there's a room full of Christians. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? Does that make you a secularist? Well, it doesn't, because we believe that, but we live as if God is real, and we, be we live because of what's coming. Not just for the present, what we'd say, the present evil age. You go to other dictionaries and they say, secularism is a spirit or tendency, especially a system of political or social philosophy, that rejects all forms of religious faith and worship. Now that actually is the definition I'd be more used to, because secular comes from the Latin word, secular, seculam, which means this age. Secularism is living for this age, as if this is what there is, and there's nothing else in terms of the resurrection of the dead, in terms of eternal life, in terms of a God who breaks into the here and now from another world, another place. As if eternity doesn't impinge in reality on people. That's secularism. These guys are secularists, they are privileged, they are secularists, and they are religious. This is a religious secularism. Now how does that work? Religious secularism acknowledges God verbally, goes through the motions, dons the trappings, but lives as if this life is all there is. Does that make sense? It's people who are religious but live in reality as if this is all there is. 
So we don't trust God to resolve our issues, but take it all upon ourselves. Hmm. So we don't trust in the Lord with all our hearts. No, we lean on our own understanding. Hmm. And we invest our lives in the very short term. We say to ourselves, life is short, death comes quick, lasts a long time. And we end up with no savings in what old Spurgeon called the bank of heaven. Faith invests what we currently have for a future reward. Religious secularists don't, because they're living for what they get now. Is this plain and clear enough? Or see where we're getting with, with, with these people. So rules, the rules about external things are, are all that such religion can relate to. A religious secularist has got rules for the here and now, nothing else. Faith, glory, prayer, grace, these are intangible in the present evil age. So these are eternal values the secularist doesn't recognise and doesn't invest in. What you can do and get now are all that matters to such people. And so that's kind of connected to the way things are going up the temple that Jesus has just been objecting to. They're making their religion something of benefit now. Let's make some money out of it. Does that make sense? They're not living as if they're a God, as a God who's going to call us to account for doing stuff like that. They're living as if a God who calls you to account or is in the frame now, holding people accountable, doesn't exist. They're living for the here and now, what we can get. This is all there is. And that's how things like the temple's corruption arise. If this world is all there is, then here is the only place to profit. And Jesus attacked their scam in chapter 11. So, no thought of the future. They attack his authority and try to do away with him for that attack. Well, why wouldn't they? They don't believe there's a future. They don't believe there's a real God who raises you from the dead and calls you to account for your deeds. Going to become an increasing feature. So that's who they are. What's their question? What's their question? They ask Jesus about leveret marriage. What is leveret marriage? Leveret marriage is a type of marriage in which the brother of a deceased man is obliged to marry his brother's widow, and the widow is obliged to, to marry her deceased husband's brother. So, I know it doesn't sound too healthy, does it? But you get societies where families in, are given the land, and land or property or whatever is linked to a family, and you've got to keep a dead guy's line going. So if you're married to somebody and you die without offspring, then your brother needs to come along, give us some offspring, so that they can inherit and carry on the process. Does that make, make sense? Um, whether it makes sense or not, you get it in Deuteronomy chapter 25, 5 to 6. You also get it in the book of Ruth, or so it appears, where the nearest kinsman, Boaz, is to, is to marry Ruth because he is the kinsman redeemer and you get the general picture. So this is not a huge matter. This is a small matter of the law. They come along with a nitpicky little question because that's the world they live in. That's how their thought patterns work nitpicky little questions and you'll find that religious secularists work on nitpicky little questions and they come along with the what if question it's a what if speculation and they come in talking about morality do you have discussions with religious people like this they go like this you're there to talk about the gospel and they're there to talk about morality and moral issues and ethics questions in ethics about which one is entitled to discuss of course and come to different conclusions and, and make it a debate a moral debate it's not a moral debate God says this that or the other do you see what I mean there's a difference isn't there morality can be the enemy of faith and it's often the avoidance question you, you know about avoidance questions uh, religious secularists secularists in general are great on avoidance questions um, whether we believe or not is not a matter of intellect is it it's a matter of something else. Because, as we were saying on, on Friday in, um, in Capo Dewi, in, in the meeting there, um, different people will see the same things. One will believe and one will not. Why is that? It's because faith is not an intellectual matter. It's, it's a moral choice. 
somebody is prepared to invest their life by faith in the reality that has just broken in and another person says if, if I believe that I don't like the consequences for my life for the choices I will then have to make for the way I'll have to spend my time and stuff like that does that make sense? so as Romans 1 says you know, people suppress the truth in their wickedness to be able to hold on to it they raise an avoidance question because Jesus is challenging their faith position what's their problem? verse 23 insincerity insincerity at the resurrection whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her do you think that's really their issue is that likely to be a big issue for them has any of them got this problem it's an avoidance question it's throwing up an irrelevance to the big issue to avoid now how do you deal with it when people do that because people will do that with us Jesus does it like this he says aren't you in error because you don't know the scripture or the power of God now here's how to deal with a secularist and it's not the way people normally do deal with people who are secularists so let's just see what Jesus is doing here your fundamental error is your secularist position says Jesus in verse 24 has anybody got that open Mark 12 24 yeah, sorry, would you read that for me again? Because that's nice, nice and. Jesus replied, I am not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. So, are you not in error? What? How can you say that to us? You should enter into debate. Sorry, dog. <laughs> Firstly, what? You're in error. What? So now they're paying attention because you don't know the scriptures. What? Them? Are you saying that to them? And you don't know the power of God. What? Okay, so that's really a strong thing. He's saying you don't know, but they are academics. They are professors of the law. And he says, you don't know the scriptures, but they are theologians. And he says, you don't know the power of God, but they are the guardians of the temple because they tend to be strongly represented in the priestly classes. They are amongst the priestly classes. And the priestly classes look over the place where God's power and Shekinah and glory is supposed to dwell behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies. You don't know the power of God. How are we supposed to handle people who are secularists ethical secularists Jesus says to them there is stuff here beyond your knowledge of the word of God there is stuff here beyond your experience you don't have the power of God there is stuff here beyond the parameters of what you've considered. The things you are not accounting for are these. You are not accounting for the Bible and what it says. You are not accounting for the power of God. Jesus does not pussyfoot around from inside their wayward ideology, their faulty thought patterns, arguing about the sort of things that they argue about. He doesn't pander very much to their worldview. Bible, power of God word spirit he doesn't praise their ethics or their contribution to the ethical debate he highlights the things they don't know understand or appreciate they don't get the scriptures they don't get the power of the Christians God there's more to this world than you know about and having done that and having dealt with the actual problem which is their secularism and their lack of awareness of what the Bible's actually saying in verse 25 then he says okay then I will tell you what the score is with marriage when the dead rise he says verse 25 they will neither marry nor be given in marriage they will be like the angels in heaven no compromise no appeasement the resurrection is real but marriage ceases with the present evil age and, and, and people are kind of they don't like that 
you say to people sometimes in our day and they say, I'm very happily married, thank you very much. I, I quite like the idea of being married in heaven. I, you know, wh where's, where's she going to go then? <laughs> What's going to happen to her? Where, where's he going to be? Where, what? Mm. <clears throat> okay, stop a minute. Why, it's, it's not a problem, it's, it's great. Why was marriage ordained in creation? God saw, what did God see and, start, and put marriage in as the answer? God saw that it was not good for a man to be alone. Is that, is that fair? That's what it says in Genesis, isn't it? Because what it says in the Bible. God saw it wasn't good for a man to be alone. So tell me, who will be alone in eternity? Will a Christian be alone in eternity if there's no marriage in eternity? No. What God is doing with Jesus and the Gospel and what he's going to do with eternity, he's going to bring all things together again under the headship of Christ. So actually, um, we'll be united to Christ and united to one another in ways that make even marriage, which is great, redundant. Does that make sense? Are we onto something? <laughs> if, it's, if it's a problem in this, you let me know. But it seems to me it's going to be better, not worse, you know? It's going to be better, not worse. There isn't going to be marriage in heaven. It's going to be better than that. Marriage is redundant in the resurrection because it's surpassed and excelled in glorious ways we can't really grasp. See, Jesus addresses their issue with marriage. And he shows them what the gospel's going to do. They're neither given married, married nor given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven in perfect praising, worshipful communion with God and with one another. The angels in heaven are not feeling lonely. But that isn't the nub of the problem they're bringing to Jesus. Not really. He answers that question that they've, they've sort of come up with. But the problem is they're secularists. They're only living for now. Verses 26 to 27. Oh, have you got that there for me? You're helping me out a lot today. No, about the dead rising. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living, the bad being seeking. So there we go. You're asking this question, and the presupposition is that there's no resurrection, because that's what the Sadducees were all about. The secularists. So the presupposition is that there is no resurrection and Jesus says, look, let's deal with this big issue you have got, not the one you try to say you've got, which you haven't. The big issue is this. Go back to your Bible. And there is God at the account of the bush, nothing minor, the foundation of the giving of the law, right? This is, this is where it all starts coming from. God starts calling the people together at this point to give them the law of God. This is the foundation of the, the people. It's the foundation of living in, under God's law, which they say they love so much. You're objecting to eternalism. You're secularists and you don't want to be an eternalist. Now, the person of faith is an eternalist. Not a I just invented that word. Is that okay with you? This is not secularism, this is eternalism. Let's be one of them. These folks are functional secularists, despite all their religion, objecting to eternal realities. And that's desperately serious because the cause to follow Christ is a call to trust him for what's to be given us in the future over what we can hold in our hand now. Objecting to eternalism. Objection to living like there's a living God to be lived with. Is it a philosophical objection? Highly unlikely is an objection to the fact that if there's a God who's alive, he's going to interfere with our life. Much the way Jesus was doing in chapter 11 of Mark when he cleared the temple, which is their big beef anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And they wish to rise above all that personal faith in a personal God stuff. They've got life the way they want it. They've got it sorted. They've got their scams in place. They've got money in the bank. They've got position, wealth and social standing. And it's all working just the way they want it. But a heaven to be won and a hell to be avoided are things they just, that they just won't fit with the lifestyle they've got so very sorted out for themselves. So Jesus shows them. Living faith in a living God is essential to the old, let alone the New Testament scriptures. About the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, long dead. 
The God of Isaac, long dead. The God of Jacob, long dead. When Moses was standing there, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Eternalism is the truth of God. The God of the book is a real God. Conclusion. It is easy to get on with life as if God isn't a present, imminent and interfering reality. He is, though. That's the thing. It's particularly easy within clearly defined religious structures like first century Sadduceism or 21st century evangelicalism where the structure is clear and the rules are obvious. It's easy to live, in fact, not on a living God but on the rules and the structures. Francis Chan was recently quoted in circles of my acquaintance speaking of the way he wants to live, saying something like this, I want to live my life so much on God that if he doesn't turn up, I'm obviously going to be really screwed. Sorry about that, he's American, they talk like that. And that's the opposite of the Sadducees' religious secularism, and to my mind that's of the essence of living by faith, and that is what Jesus is trying to get these people who are religious secularists to see. It's about living on God for his future. Does that make sense? But well, may God help us every day this week when we've got to get up and we've got to get on with the, the nitty gritty things to have regular reminders of the presence and the reality of a living God on whom we live and for whom it's going to be worth it because there is a future and there is a resurrection and there is a life to come. And we are going to be in the common phrase dead a long time, yeah, which is all the more reason we invest in that future now.